We are recording now. So welcome everyone to this virtual interim meeting of the core working group. Uh, this is Marco Pioca, my co-chair is um, Jaime Jimenez. Uh, we are going to have six interim meetings before ITF uh, 111, and you can see we are back on the on the Wednesdays. So as usual, this is an official ITF meeting, which is recorded and the note 12 applies. So be sure to get familiar with it if you're not. And this is not only about IPR, it's also about code of conduct. So uh, please be nice with one another. And the agenda for today is about two uh, related topics. Uh, first, John will present about limits of AED ciphers and key usage with those ciphers in general and about how we should take this into account in core. And then we have a separate presentation from, from Ricard related to the uh, ongoing draft on how this should be especially handled in OSCORE. So anyone who wants to best the agenda for today? No, then we can uh, move to the first topic. Uh, please, Francesca. Yeah, just wanted to mention that um, the um, draft ITF core new block um, has finished last call and it has been, um, or the ballot has been issued. So it will most likely go into um, uh, into next week's telechat. And the other document that is waiting with me is the uh, core SID 15. And I am waiting on Karsten. And I think he mentioned that uh, um what's the status now i'm not i don't have it in front of me the status was that we wanted to get a meeting going between the authors and and the shepherd and maybe a couple more uh, people and that is still pending okay great thank you thank you so john floor is yours uh, thank you. Uh, so this is, uh, if you use something official for the meeting material, take the second link later. It has a new front page. The ADs complained that this was too much of a light, lightly dressed girl. Uh, <laughs> so, so the other version has a traffic limit instead, but otherwise the content is the same, so we can use this. Uh, Next, so next slide, I think we can go through this quite quickly, just focusing on uh, the high level recommendation from this. Uh, uh, so yes, the fresh up, so there are Q is the number of protected messages. V is the number of forgery attempts, i.e. number of failed a aided decryption invocations uh, approximately and then l is the maximum length of each, each message in blocks uh, so, so 128 bits or 16 bytes and uh, i completely agree with the analysis in tls and dtls that this is necessary we should have this kind of counters and we should rekey and then rekeying is maybe even more important is that we limit um, the impact of key compromise. But uh, compared to other limits where you have like you want to um, avoid nonce reuse or something, these are not very strict limits. So the limits set by TLS and what OSCORE will set is quite arbitrary and very soft limits. If you go over them, everything will not break. You will get maybe two to the power of 62 bits, 62 bit security instead of 63 or 64 or something, but it will slowly get worse. Uh, next slide. Uh, so basically, what I think what we can do is we can we can use 
a slight a better process for how co to calculate these um, the numbers. So I, this slide is not about how the actual process will be in OSCOR. That's wicked. This is how do we set numbers for the Q and the limits that Richard Stroud later will use. And I think some of the TLS numbers we can relax enormously uh, for CCM8. Some other of the values we should maybe make a little bit stricter to make CCM8 uh, be a perfect Mac. Can take next. So, yeah, um, we don't need to go through these uh, mostly. So, charge, I think you can, you don't need any limit at all. It's basically a perfect PRF if you want to treat it the same way as AS is a um, permutation. Uh, maybe important to keep in mind that the attacks you're protecting against here is very very different one is uh, an online attack which if it happens have very drastic consequences you for a message the other is distinguishing which is offline uh, but on the other hand it's like um, probably nothing happens if the attacker can distinguish uh, this he can just to see that is oscar he can just look at the port number or something and uh, and see that so uh, there's a uh, it can be a quite large gap between this theoretical attack and something practical. Next slide. Mm. Uh, I think we can move on. It says that CCM8 behaves quite a lot like the 60 perfect 64 bit Mac. Uh, and also that limiting C advantage per key makes does not make very much sense in the security protocol where you have multiple keys per connection you can have um, multi and you can have a lot of also connections between the same two peers uh, next uh, it's quite easy. You don't need to do very much advanced calculations to see when it makes sense to rekey. If you have a linear function, you don't really get any benefits from rekeying uh, directly. If it's quadratic, things will get worse and worse, and at some point you need to rekey. Can take the next. I think we can go back to these slides if there's something we need. Um, Yeah, here it it's a second bullet here is that some of the values in TLS we might want to make a bit stricter. Uh, right now, CCM deviates also in the beginning from an ideal Mac, which we will see in the graphs in the coming slides. So we might want to lower Q and L, and I think we can do that without any big consequences. And V, on the other hand, we can make very, very large for CCM. John, John uh, something maybe worth clarifying. What, 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 what is the practical implication of lowering Q and L? Uh, so Q is the number of produced messages with the same key, and L is the length of the maximum uh, message. Um, that you allow. So it's actually L that we are lowering compared to um, the TLS computations, right? Uh, R and R. It, it, this slide suggests lowering Q and L. Um, but we could also, based on at least if it's not a problem doing so, if you do that, CCM behaves like an ideal Mac also for low values of V. 
right. the counter. Um, okay. But whether it's absolutely necessary to do that, I don't think you could also use the TLS numbers and say that you are as good as TLS. I, I don't think any of these is rel really essential. I think TLS working group has been taking these numbers a little bit too serious. Right, but Q and V appears later, but L L doesn't will not appear in in Rickard's document, for example. So I think the impact of lowering L needs to be uh, made clear. Actually, yeah, L will appear because it's part of the formulas. Um, okay. In the CFRD document, so we assume the one thousand twenty four two to the power of ten as L. Okay. So okay. if that lowers, it will change the, the results. All right. Good. Yeah. Then I'm happy. Thank you. I think that needs to be probably been stated in Richard's draft, uh, whatever value we uh, decide to use. Next. Here is just some first graphs. You can see uh, how. Uh, Changing these parameters improves the security if you lower L on the left side. On the right side, you can see how a suggestion, the suggested process that I made, I think it seems better than the TLS, but I only uh, used it for a week. So, it, uh, but uh, showing how you can measure the security level and then you basically take the minimum y value of the graphs from here 0 to 20 and then you draw a line and then you get your security level. The attacker will attack the weakest point here. Uh, and on the lower left you see some how it affects if you lower both L and Q. Um, the next slide. Mm. Here's mostly theoretical that you actually can get, depending on how you measure, you can actually get lower security by uh, uh, with multi-key, at least depending on how you measure. If you measure security level, I think everything will be, then you will get the same again. Yeah. You can take next slide. So John, again, what's the practical aspect of multi-key? Is that you have multiple security associations between the same endpoints or, or what's yeah yeah uh, typically in in the academic literature it's known as multi-user uh, because these type of attacks started i think maybe with the hostad and some attack paper on rsa and then it was assumed that each user has one key um so, so therefore it in the academic literature is known as single user, single multi-user, but in reality it's just uh, one or more keys. The attacker attack one of many keys or it attacks a single key. It doesn't really matter who owns the key or if one person owns many keys. Um, okay. But if you have, if you do rekeying then the single OSCOR or TLS DTLS connection is Multi key. Mm. Right. Yeah. Next slide. I think this is maybe the most uh, relevant here. This slide comes to completely different conclusions than the, the TLS process, which I think is flawed. Uh, so on the left side, you see the uh, uh, security level here on, uh, or it's actually not the security, the security level is the minimum of these. So it's rather complexity uh, or here for different values of V. But as you can see, the green line is a perfect 64-bit Mac. 
and the blue line is CCM, the blue curve is CCM8. And as we can see, it deviates a little bit from a perfect MAC in the beginning, and you actually get only 60 bits, but if you lower L and Q a little bit, then it behaves like a perfect MAC uh, until uh, almost to, to the power of 40, at least to, to the power of 35 or something. Um, so we can definitely, and CCM8 is not worse than CCM with a full MAC in this aspect. It's rather it's can't say it's better, but it's it's much closer to a 64-bit Mac than the full CCM is close to a 128-bit perfect Mac. Uh, so as long as you're fine with 64-bit security for forger, which I definitely think is not a problem at all. Just an attacker trying this on a lot of constraint OT would take. Uh, I don't remember, I did some calculation maybe on the next slide. It's a long time. Uh, basically, you don't need to be concerned. Uh, as long as you take this offline, it's online, sorry. Uh, yeah, this is an online attack, yeah. So next. Uh, so yeah, I think we all here we can see you need to to sixty four bit tag. You need four point three billion messages per second for sixty eight years. Um, that's quite a lot. Uh, so I think that's not the problem. CCM8 is basically a perfect Mac. Uh, so basically, I think my recommendation would be to basically use, take the TLS, the TLS values, the process is a bit flawed, but most of the values they get out are quite reasonable anyway, except for CCM8. I think we can take the TLS values, we can use a much, much, much higher V value for CCM8. Should, as we will probably mostly use CCM8, we should maybe consider lowering the Q and L value for, uh, to, uh, then we can, then we, the analysis is that CCM8 is almost a perfect um, MAC. Uh, for all the values we will use. Uh, otherwise, I don't know what is easiest when we discussed this last time with, and Christian had some idea that it was to allow easy implementation, they should be, Q and E should be similar or something. I don't remember the details of this, but um, I think there's a lot of, um, it, whatever we choose will be quite arbitrary uh, uh, to some degree, at least. It's uh, whatever you choose will be based on a lot of assumption. Um, and I think as long as we choose anything in this range, it will be very, very secure. Just one question. So <clears throat> we can definitely uh, lower the L value in, the, in this post-core AD limits document. As far as lowering the Q, I guess the Q is the output from the formula. So the the way to lower it would be to reconsider these probabilities. I think you mentioned those in an earlier slide where you had these boxes. Yeah, I think you should uh, not consider these probabilities at all. The conclusion from this is that the TLS process makes no sense. So we should not consider those probabilities. We should rather sh consider some other probabilities. Uh, I don't think probabilities makes much sense, except for maybe forgery. Then you have, then it's very clear what the probability means. Uh, I don't know. I think it's inventing a, the process will probably not go. 
I would say that we, my suggestion would be that we take the TLS values and lower them, and then we can at least say we are more secure than TLS, unless we want to, I think as long as we are, choose lower or equal values as TLS, uh, we, we don't need to be justify it very much. Right, so, so we would choose lower for Q and lower for L, but for V, I guess we would end up with a higher than the, what it is currently, which is uh, like two to the power of seven or 112. Yeah, I don't think that's a problem. I think we can motivate that with this slide set and presentation. Um. So this would be, um, so I sort of outlining this and motivating this would go into security considerations in, in Rickard's draft then. Yeah. Yeah, we could uh, definitely mention the lower L and yes, one final thought though is that you said earlier we shouldn't uh, consider probabilities, but to use these formulas from the C4D document, we would need to decide on some probability P values. Uh, and if we don't take them from DTLS, we would need to motivate or take them from some other place or, or justify them ourselves. Uh, no, not really. I don't think you should do any probabilities whatsoever. What I suggest here is that you choose a security level, which is a much more neutral uh, thing to do. Um, okay, so you're saying basically to not fundamentally not use those formulas from the CFRG document. I think the formulas are correct, but the process how you get any limits from these formula formulas is is very flawed and very arbitrary. Right, but if we don't have those formulas to rely on. You're saying we should just like state certain limits ourselves. Uh, what I what you could do if you want to invest in doing a process would be to, for example, to use the inequalities in the CFRG document. These are these are correct, but they're still like inequalities. This is they they are not tight uh, equations. There are inequality, you could use these and then you can calculate the security level if, if you want and motivate it that way. But uh, yeah, right, could, could you go back to slide two or three maybe? I would, but I or, personally, I don't think it's, yeah, yeah. yeah I don't so, think it's worth the effort to, to do that. I would just pick some values that are equal or lower than TLS and write that we are more secure than TLS at least, and then severely higher the CCMD value and motivate this with this slide set. Right, so we can, we pick a lower value for, for Q, but for we, we, we don't want to pick a higher value basically. And there we have to then motivate why we pick that. Uh, yeah, value. My, my, I don't know if there is any implementation aspects of the one one way would be to pick like two to the power of 20 for both q and v for all algorithms for example um, or something like that yeah right then it's just about how do we how do we justify for q because it's lower i mean then that's easy to justify like you said we're doing taking a safer limit there for v for v it would be lower except for CCM8, right? Where we would then choose a higher limit yeah. than the formula scheme. So that would yeah. be the important thing to motivate. I think you can just motivate that uh, the TLS process is wrong and CCM8 behaves like a perfect 64 bit Mac until way, way, way higher than two to the power of 20. Right. And then the, the, the place to put a text would basically be in this in this draft, in this uh, OSCORE AAD limits uh, draft. Yeah, that would be my suggestion, not spend much time at all in inventing. And uh, I think the process in this document is better than the TLS process, but I don't know if it's 
I was not planning to to document it more than this. I'm not sure it's uh, worth the effort. I don't know what the CFRG group will do. I will object to the current process being published, I think. Right, because then they may, right, if you object to that, they can take the feedback into account and maybe they will change that document and we, we still refer to that to some extent. So, of course, we should see how that yeah. develops. But I, um, think, I think motivation is, there seems to be agreement about this presentation in SOG, so I don't think we will get any problems. I think everybody agrees that the TLS process is quite flawed. Right. Well, okay. Then, um, yeah, we definitely appreciate your uh, input also on how to formulate this text to motivate the uh, the high V limit. So maybe we can have further discussions on that. Yeah, sure. I can. I can do some. Uh, I can do a pull request to the draft if you want. Yeah, that would be yeah. uh, very nice. Um, uh, John, one question about raising V. Um, how can you, we, motivate that it has been raised enough? Wasn't that exactly what we discussed? Well, we discussed to, to raise it to some value that is good enough and makes sense, but how do you motivate that the new value makes sense and is good enough in general? Just wondering. Uh, the uh, previous slide uh, on this? There, it behaves, it's very easy to see that this behaves extremely close to a perfect Mac uh, until uh, to the power of 35, uh, at least. Okay. All right, I think that's the core, core aspect that will be to, to motivate that uh, raising of the V value, because everything else we're actually lowering compared to the output from the CFRG formulas. Yeah, so I think these values will probably, the CFRG values will probably change. I, I hope the, the formulas inequalities is correct, but any values they get out this, I don't know, see if audio document talk a little bit about the process and then it talks a little bit about the values that TLS and DTLS has chosen, but yeah. Right. And we should also check just by lowering L what impact that has um, in the first place on the V limit for ASCCM8, what the new result will be from that, yeah. But I don't know, I think the important thing is to, um, I think IDF has spent, we have already spent way, way too much time on this. <laughs> I think the important thing, more important, this is not really security. It's important to, to re-key before you get extremely high numbers here, but otherwise it's, um, there is much more imp important security things to do. This is this has been blown out of proportion. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I think I think the implementation aspect, like Christian brought up last time, is there anything? What would two to the power of twenty or two to the power of twenty three mean? Is there will there be a difference in practice? And also message lengths, is there a difference for the application? Um, also note that TLS does a simplification, assuming that all the messages are like max, maximum length. Okay, and definitely if you can provide some early text with a pull request, it would be great. I yes. think I can do that after we have decided on some numbers. I think that's uh, easy. Writing that is five minutes work for me and it's easy, but I think core group needs to decide on what, what numbers should we choose. I think that's 
that's mostly not a security question. It's more implementation and what does it, how will it impact applications using OSCORE if we choose different numbers? Right. And reducing L would also limit then the maximum uh, message size allowed. Then would be 256 bytes for uh, L2 to the power of 8. Okay, any opinion uh, from the group? Any more input to this? Early implementation consideration. Okay, then we take this uh, as a start, including the number suggested here. I think that's a good start anyway. Yeah. Okay. If there's nothing more to add on this particular item, we can move to the next one. Mark, Marco, do Please. we need uh, did, do we need to have any offline discussion on on this on these choices here, or is it a mail thread, or how do you see do we progress on on that? A mail thread on the list would work, I think. Yeah, that can make sense to start the discussion then based on the some numbers here proposed in the slides and initiate some discussion, see what feedback comes on that, yeah. Yeah, I remember Christian had some, some ideas what he wanted. Um, yeah, he may have some, some feedback. We take this also to the list then. Okay. Uh, moving on then, the follow-up to this and more practical to uh, a draft considering this as a starting point for all score. So just tell me when to change slide, Richard. Right. Right. So this is a um, presentation on this draft about uh, this AAD key use its limits uh, in the context of all score. Uh, next slide, please. So just to recap the problem, which of course has been recapped a bit already, but now OSCORE uses AED algorithms to provide security. And there are these forgery attacks against AED algorithms. And uh, this is described in that CFRG document that's referred there. And the problem is that adversaries may break the security properties of the AED algorithm. And this draft will focus on um, the AAD limits and their impact on OSCORE. And that includes first, uh, yeah, like defining appropriate limits for OSCORE. Um, as we discussed, it may be the case that OSCORE uh, shouldn't just uh, blindly take the, the, the formulas and, and limits described in the CFRG document. Um, and the second step is uh, how does this forgery attack and the limits affect OSCORE? Um, that can be in terms of what steps do you need to take during message processing? For instance, counting sent uh, messages or received messages. And what actions should you take when the limits are exceeded? Uh, that can be uh, rekeying the uh, context. So next slide, please. Yeah, sorry if you hear some background noise there some construction here but so basically what do you need to count so the q value represents the number of messages protected with a specific key meaning the number of times this key has been used to encrypt data and the v value is then the number of forgery attempts made against a specific key meaning the amount of failed encryptions for that key and in the context of OSCOR, um, what this means is and uh, what we have added to the OSCOR security context are uh, these new parameters, uh, one is count Q to count the number of times a sender key has been used for encryption. We have count V to count the number of times a recipient key has been used for failed decryption. And both of these counters then have associated limits, limit Q and limit V, which will limit how high these counters may go. And if the limits are exceeded, another context must be rekeyed. And this draft also has an overview of 
existing methods for uh, the keying of score that could be used. <clears throat> and, and currently, again, like the the values and the calculations we have in this document currently is that's based on the C4D document and then the probabilities that was chosen from DTLS. That's the current uh, material. Next slide, please. And now going over some updates since uh, ITF 110. And this material is also in the available in the editor's copy of the draft uh, in the GitLab repo. So one thing that was added was a table with the QMV limits for further algorithms. Um, AES, uh, also AES 128 CCM, 128 GCM, 256 GCM, and the Cha Cha Poly. And before we only had the AES uh, 128 CCM8. And uh, of course, like this, these values are still based on that C4D document and the assumptions from DTLS. And uh, in addition to that, uh, we have extended a section about methods for OSCORE keying. So now it also mentions, previously it mentioned the, the ACE um, OSCORE profile, uh, ad hoc, um, and like manual uh, key update, let's say, and the OSCORE Appendix B2. Now it also mentions that you may, as another alternative, if you're using lightweight M2M, and this is a situation where you have a lightweight M2M server and lightweight M2M client, you may um, bootstrap, the client may bootstrap again towards the lightweight M2M bootstrap server, which will provide it with uh, updated security context if the material on the bootstrap server was actually updated. And both the lightweight m time client and the lightweight m time server may initiate this bootstrapping procedure. Either client takes initiative to bootstrap on its own, but it's also possible for the server to tell the client to go and bootstrap. So in either case, if one of them gets uh, close to reaching these limits or exceeding the limits, uh, if it's the client, it can bootstrap on its own. If it's the server, it can tell the client, like, you know, please go and bootstrap. Um, yeah, next slide, please. And another update that was stating this fact that messages that are detected as replays do not affect the count V value. Um, and this is also something that was brought up at the previous interim, and we got agreement on this point that since these are fundamentally replayed messages, they should not be counted as failed decryptions. So they will not affect the count V. Uh, parameter. And another point was adding this expiration timestamp on the score security context. Um, so it's basically an integer, integer value similar to a Unix timestamp that indicates at which point in time um, this score security context may not be used anymore for processing messages. And the idea is that when the context is established, you you take the current time and you take a certain uh, time offset that should be the lifetime, and then you can calculate your expiration timestamp. And when that is reached, uh, you should not use this context any further. And the last point was kind of general editorial improvement, some restructuring, uh, fixing some, some uh, sentences and words and general uh, improvements. Yeah, next slide, please. And then we come to the open points. So the first one is, what should the default lifetime be of an OSCORE security context? Because now we have this expiration parameter that is set when installing the security context, which basically is the current point in time plus this lifetime. And if the lifetime is not provided from elsewhere, it could possibly provide it from, from other sources like um, if you're using ad hoc, it may be uh, some pre-configuration there in the applicability statement, or there could be other ways to set this up. But if you don't have an actual uh, lifetime defined, or it's not provided, there should be an appropriate default lifetime to use. And uh, by the way, also the lifetimes and this uh, expiration date and time, they don't have to match on the pairs because if one has a shorter expiration or shorter lifetime, the one that reaches the expiration first will simply take the initiative to rekey with other party. 
so they don't have to synchronize on exactly the same values. But there would be um, a need to choose some appropriate default if none is provided. So that's one of the points. I think you should clarify what the lifetime of a security context that's um, do you mean secure lifetime of a key here? Yeah, the life I mean the lifetime of the keys in the context basically, so that when you reach yeah. this limit you, you need to rekey the context. Yeah. Yeah. I can also that. Right. And then the second point there was uh, that we need to consider how to make the, the count V and count Q parameters work well for constrained devices. I mean, in the case that a constrained device supports Appendix B2, meaning it stores its sender sequence number, to be able to reboot and then continue using the same context, it now also needs to store the count V and count Q as to not lose track of them upon reboot. And so the point here would be to allow safe continued usage of uh, a score security context after a boot. And in Appendix V1, there is the solution to not store every sender sequence number. You only store it per periodically to reduce the number of writes to a non-volatile memory. And um, this would be a similar situation where you don't want to store every count Q and count V because then you're really writing a lot to the disk. You only want to store them periodically, but still make sure that you have them still available uh, after reboot. But the, the thing is here that we need to consider what rate to store this at, because if the rate is too large, uh, then when you reboot, let's say you, you save every 100 count V, that means that if you are at count V1 and then you reboot, you jump all the way to count V100. And if the V limit is quite low, as we have now in the current figures, of course that will change, but then a reboot or even two reboots would put you over the current limit. So um, you need to be a bit careful on the on the rates that are decided for how often to store these values, especially for count V. Have we decided that storing these numbers, is that the only solution feels like you can also have some idea where you uh, reboot, you rekey as soon as you reboot? That's true. Yeah, definitely. Like you can have that choice. Let's say you don't even support Appendix B1, or you simply say that, well, if I reboot, either way, I will lose the sender sequence number. Um, you can choose to reboot. Uh, sorry, you can choose to rekey if you reboot. Uh, so it's not mandatory in all situations. It's just that if you want to support Appendix B1 and be able to con continue using your security context from where you left off, then you also need to save count Q and count V. So count the, the counts that you save are essentially um, a limit up to which you can just use new numbers without storing that. Um, so if you actually have a clock and can rely on that, mm -hmm. uh, then you don't have to have these things constant. You can actually uh, do a... a a uh, simple linear uh, formula for the number count that should be applying uh, at the time um, a reboot actually happens. And as long as you stay below that line, uh, you don't have to store anything. So that, that, that would mean, uh, again, as, as long as you have a, a re clock you can rely on at the level of, of uh, uh, security, Considerations, um, but uh, if if you can can draw this line, um, then you essentially never have to save the counts. So you mean you base the count depending on the time, or you? But it's not certain the count will grow linearly with time. Because... No, if it if it uh, grows beyond the line that you have been drawing, then you have to store. Okay, that, that may be something to explore. I need to understand that a bit better, but you're saying basically to utilize yeah. the fact I that think if that, you have that, a that, that works much better if you uh, make a few drawings, but uh, mm. it's an obvious way to extend the, the scheme out of um, RFC 8613 and uh, uh, take into account that uh, most applications have a rough idea 
of uh, uh, the the uh, number of messages uh, that will be sent and of the um, rough lifetime uh, the the device will work under. So you can actually uh, choose uh, a constant and, and a linear factor and, and use that. But again, it only works if you have a reliable clock. Yeah. I think we should allow many different implementation of of this. But I guess that's the probably the suggestion to here to have this in a appendix more guidance. This is how you can recover. Um, yeah, the, the initial idea we had was this kind of rate you save every 50 country, for instance, but of course, this could be a more flexible if we want to allow more more freedom for implementations to do it in more clever ways. Yeah. But I guess, like in OSCORE, this saving every, every nth is just a suggestion for an implementation. This is exactly. the only way you can do it. Yeah. The only yeah, right. mandatory is that you, you must not exceed the limit Q and limit V. How you make sure to not do that is up to the implementation. So the, the main point of actually recording these things in the draft um, is to make sure that people know that this can be done and mm. other people can't go ahead patenting the, the obvious <laughs> schemes. Yeah, uh, I think it's great to document these things and give give guidance. It's also good. It's not trivial to come up with these things and so they work. So it's very good if we can give guidance also. Right, yeah, there can be implementation, implementation guidelines so people uh, but, uh, don't miss this point, let's say, and then an idea on how one way to do it, which will be this uh, saving every n, yeah. So, so Karsten, just to understand your idea, are, are you saying, with my words, then you're saying that you basically we have an application has an idea of a number of messages per, per uh, the maximum number of messages that can be pr processed in, in a certain time interval, and then you draw the line, a sort of a, a line slightly below that, and, and, and that means that you will uh, you will always. Um, I mean, if if you don't even reach up to that line, then you then you don't need to store the count. Is that something like that? Yeah, the the, the idea is that what you save in in the storage locations allows you to have a safe assumption uh, for continuing after a reboot. Uh, so what whatever you can can save there that allows you to derive such an assumption at a reboot is fine as long as the the implementation that actually counts uh, remembers that uh, it, it uh, needs to be on the safe side of that line. Yeah, makes sense to me. Good, thanks. All right, thanks for the input. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Next slide, I don't see it update yet. Hello, can you still hear me? Hear you, Richard, but I don't see any progress on the slides either. No. Maybe some technical problems. Now I should be back again. Right, hello. Yeah, I lost the last two or three minutes. Okay. okay. I was kicked out of WebEx altogether. Right. Yeah, we, we, we wonder what, what happened, but assume some technical issues. Yeah. Do you see the slides still, by the way? Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. Yes. At least the resumption works fine. Please go ahead. Yes, I was just saying, uh, thanking everyone for the for the feedback on these points. And, and uh, next slide, please. <laughs> right, and then another point is to further explore optimizations for tracking count Q. And um, 
this can again be helpful for constrained devices and this would be in general on how to to keep track of queue basically so that one idea could be that you don't have an explicit count queue uh, parameter but you instead rely on the sender sequence number so one one example is using the sender sequence number together with this uh, x where x would be the amount of the number of outgoing messages you sent without partial ID. So basically the SSM plus X would, would be the same as count Q. So there you don't need an explicit count Q variable. So you can save some memory overhead thereby uh, cleverly reusing the SSN also for this. And then another uh, possibility would be that you rely only on the sender sequence number. Um, here we have some I have some backup slides on this point also, but basically you would then, in that case, sacrifice some accuracy and accept more frequent rekeyings, uh, because you may end up in a situation where you don't go all the way up until the, the full theoretical uh, limit you could have gone to. But we can come back to that if we cover the backup slides. And then, yeah, another point here was, if this limit, can this, could they possibly be defined in a more general location? Um, of course, they can be defined now in this, this OSCR AD limits draft, but if they are per algorithm specific, um, then they could possibly be defined in some place like the COSI algorithms registry. Uh, although, as we've discussed now, maybe this would be, this limit would be in this case specific to score, and then in that case, it makes more sense to keep them all in this document. Um, and then the last point here was, yeah, how do we adapt these limits to be more uh, specific and suitable for OSCOR? And there, uh, one point was this, like, should we, for instance, consider different probabilities, PQ and PV? Um, I understood from Jon that he thought that wasn't um, something we should consider. Basically, we shouldn't really consider these, these probabilities or, or um, to plug them into those formulas from the CFRD document. And the other point would be like, if we now consider different limits for OSCOR, what kind of authoritative and uh, appropriate reference do we use to produce these, these numbers? Like that could either be now the CFRD document will be updated. Um, it could be some other source, or as we discussed earlier, it could also end up that um, we justify and describe why we chose these numbers in this actual draft. And yeah, the last point, of course, we're synchronizing with John on this, and uh, we we could discuss more with him. And like he, he said, he could make some pull request, and um, then we can start putting together the text on how to justify these limits for uh, for Oscor. Right. Yeah. Next slide, please. Yeah, that's the end of the uh, regular slides. There are some backups too, but. Uh, any questions at this point? Uh, no question. High level, what I think, the two aspects that I think is important for the group to discuss, and which we have so far not discussed a single minute this meeting, is what, how does different limit affect applications? And secondly, how do we do rekeying? Um, how do you how do you do lightweight rekeying with or without not resetting the sequence numbers? And how do you do rekeying so you get uh, forward secrecy? Um, right. Yeah. And now now in this draft, it's it it only describes existing methods for rekeying. Um, of course, the ad hoc is, is a good one there if you want uh, forward secrecy. But um, did you have in mind some, let's say, some new method for rekeying? Yeah, that was what we discussed uh, at uh, some earlier interim meeting, I think, or hackathon. Um, I, I think we said we should, should produce another draft, which which is looking at key updates and describing different alternatives. Yes, we, I recall we, we had those discussions and we, we, we continued some discussions 
on that also. So that, yeah, that would be definitely a, then a suitable thing for a, a, a new draft. Uh, um, apart from this one. Yeah. Why would we have a new draft? Like putting these numbers, like they needed to have these AAD limits and just state that you need to rekeying that amount of text for that is minimal. Uh, Right. I mean, yeah, I think uh, as far as I recall our early discussions, we kind of had this idea of splitting things like this would be the, the first draft and there could be a follow up about new methods for keying, but I guess it could also be, be something to reconsider and add more material to this current uh, draft. I don't think this draft works unless you know how to do frequent rekeying. Yeah. yeah, but it does, I mean, it does describe the existing methods, so you have I think it's well fundamentally four, which would be the yeah the ACE Oscar profile ad hoc, Oscar appendix B two the current uh, incarnation of it, uh, or then also light with M two M possibility, or as a fifth one, yeah, manually changing the, the the context information. So there are existing ways, but sure there is room for the same improved or updated Oscar appendix B two. I, if I understand you right, John, what you're saying is that if we have another draft which describes different ways of updating the keys, then that would sort of be dependent on this one. So we would, what is written currently in this draft would need to be updated. So they are somehow closely linked to each other. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't mind if we expand this on this draft in this direction. I don't know if there is. I, I, don't, so I think. Yes, point. These are the two things I was hoping to get from the meeting today. I think these are the two things that are important to discuss. Uh, yeah, I mean, we did have plans to. Yeah. to uh, I'm not to, saying yeah. these limits are 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 extre very needed, but it's like it's um, it's quite obviously how to make them. I think. I, my presentation is not very important. It's just showing that the TLS process is, is very flawed. Um, right, right. Yeah, I mean, we, we did have a plans to, to just basically start a new draft on Oscar rekeying, um, update the methods for Oscar rekeying um, as a separate one. But if people feel that this would fit better in this draft already, that's certainly a possibility. I don't know. I just feel that that's probably more more urgent, urgent than prioritized than. But John, you seem to have a preference for a single document covering uh, the the numbers and keeping track of them and uh, the procedure. Does anyone have any strong idea in favor or against? Otherwise, we can start building on your preference on that. Yeah, that should uh, work. It's fine with me to add that additional material to this draft, and then uh, the title may be uh, changed a bit and to make it more general, um, both describing these limits and also then a, a new method for for rekeying Osco, which ideally then gives perfect forward secrecy and nice security properties based on the current appendix B2. Most likely. Thanks for the input, John. And if there are no more input uh, on this, uh, I think, Ricard, you mentioned some backup slides on that particular uh, point on the optimization. Uh, we may go through them. Yes, we could certainly do that. Um, I noticed John mentioned also how the limits affect the uh, applications, but um, I think I can go through the backup slides. Um, yeah, it shouldn't take too long. Just two slides. Okay. So this is describing a possible optimization for the count Q to keeping track of count Q without explicitly having a count Q parameter in those for context. Uh, one drawback of this would be that you basically have a pessimistic overestimation. So you overestimate the, the actual value of count Q, it would be higher than 
if you had an explicit counter. So you may end up rekeying earlier than need to be. And well, the point here is that basically like at any point in time, you know that an endpoint, the maximum number of encryptions it's, it has done is its own sender sequence number uh, added with the sender sequence number of the other endpoint. Uh, because the, the other endpoint sender sequence number can serve as an overestimation of the responses without partial AV that you as, you know, the, this endpoint has sent. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Sorry, is this, sorry, Richard, is this, this is no. from the point of view of, of the client or who is counting here? Yeah, in this case, it could be the point of view of the client, yes. Okay. Uh, it, it, it goes into further details in the next slide, actually, yes. Uh, so here it's more, more uh, defined. So basically, before performing an encryption, uh, an endpoint stops and invalidates the security context. If your sender sequence number plus X exceeds limit Q, so basically the count Q will be represented as the sender sequence number plus X. Um, and we, in this case, you determine X in the two of uh, the following, one of the following two ways. Uh, if you're producing an outbound response, X would be the partial AV in the request you're responding to. So basically, X is kind of a, a stand-in then for the other party's sender sequence number, right? Which would be the partial AV in the request it has just sent to you. And, and back to your point, Jordan, I mean, this could work uh, regardless, actually, if you're a client or server, it's just, uh, it works in either case. Okay. And um, on the other hand, if you're producing an outbound request, then X would be the highest partial, partial AV value that you have re received in your uh, replay window, or the replay window size minus one, if you have not received any messages yet. Um, so basically, X, in the case you're producing an outbound request, would be the highest partial AV you've seen from the other party, meaning the highest uh, sender sequence number. So essentially what you're doing is X with X you're estimating the other party sender sequence number, and you're adding that to your own. And as we saw in the last slide, basically you know that you can't have done more encryptions than uh, your, your and the other party sender sequence numbers combined. So if you follow that rule, you know you will be safe. On the other hand, you may you may end up overestimating the 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 count queue and then rekeying before you actually reach the um, the the limit queue basically the actual limit queue because you're just estimating count queue you're overestimating count queue um, by using this uh, method. But, but the overestimate is factor two, right? Or what's or, or what? How large is the overestimate? How large can the overestimation be? Um. Yeah, I believe it could be, it depends, I guess, it could be, it depends on the message pattern, let's say, or if you're, um, but I think, yes, that makes sense. The highest it could be would be two, um, like two times overestimation. Uh, of course, it depends, let's say you, you send one request and the other party sends you tons of notifications, or it could be you're sending tons of requests and the other party is not even responding at all. So it depends on the traffic pattern, but yeah, I believe you're right that the the, the maximum or estimation you may reach is uh, twice, two times as high of the actual count queue. So that would correspond to one power of, in, in, I mean, we are talking about the 220 or 221, that, that would sort of be one of yeah, and right, that that's order. Sort of. Yeah, one, one, two to the power of, uh, yeah, I see your point, right, yeah. Um, yeah, so that may, depending on the traffic pattern or depending on your actual setup, that may not be a nice overestimation. On the other hand, if you use this optimization, you save the need to have an explicit count queue parameter. You can reuse the SSN, uh, which saves some memory overhead. And I also recall in, in some earlier meetings we discussed with Christian on some, some ideas he had on other possible ways of optimization. But this is, a bit, this is based on, on his suggestion. Um, but I recall he also had some input on this, so we should discuss further with him. But there could be room for, for these kind of optimizations for um, reduced memory overhead in the counting procedure. 
Yes, and also two two backup slides uh, that was prepared. Thank you. Any more comment questions for Ricard? Okay, uh, trying to sum up. So uh, we got some good input from, from John on new better numbers to use here as more appropriate. So we can build on that uh, as actual numbers and on security consideration, but uh, we are going to have a thread on the list to discuss that more. Uh, there are feedback to address some of these open points. And, and the one on rebuilding on Appendix B1 uh, of OSCOR can actually be uh, further expanded. And yes. then we say we can actually take the path where uh, a broader draft can cover both uh, this topic and the possible actual uh, lightweight working approach. Uh, and I know, John, you also like to have more discussion on how applications are affected by this. Uh, I suppose you mean both the numbers and the lightweight recing procedure. Uh, yeah, I think uh, lightweight recing procedures is basically required if you want to do re frequent recing. I think you you want to do that both for the basically equally much because of the AAD limits, but also to get forward secrecy, which is very quickly becoming best practice to always do. Um, the feedback, I think we should consider whether we should use, uh, how much should we, should we use two to the power of 23 or should we use different values for all the algorithms? Is it easier to use two to the power of 23 for all of them? Does it matter if you have two to the power of 20 or two to the power of 23 or 22 or 21? And does the message size matter as much? Is there applications that want to send two to the power of 10 instead of two to the power of nine or two to the power of eight? Uh, your, your, question, your question, does it matter is referred to the application on to the security. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, completely. This question is completely non-security. I think okay. the non-security discussions are much more important to have. Uh, right. Right. How the exact limits affect the applications. Yeah. Uh, I can make new graphs for CCM8, how, how different values of Q and L makes it deviate more or less from the ideal Mac could be and what security level you get in the beginning. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think it's important to find out is this like, is this limiting for for applications? Yeah. I mean, right. right. So, but the implication for the applications would be, yeah, more, more frequent rekeying basically. And okay, yeah, reduce, maybe yeah. smaller messages. Exactly right. Reducing yeah. L that could be again like if you reduce that to two to the power of eight, you end up with two hundred fifty six bytes. As no, maximum. it's two to fifty six blocks. Oh, okay, two hundred fifty six blocks. Okay. Yeah, so it's not so limiting, but mm. if if two to fifty six blocks is limiting, then you might consider two to the power of nine or two to the power of ten, and maybe lower Q. And you could also make something a little slightly more complex than TLS and not just assume that all the messages have the maximum size. Uh, but then, of course, you, you get complexity in the application. I guess the most exact approach would be to actually uh, like calculate the length of all, sum up, sum the length of all the messages and use that instead just n times the maximum allowed size. Uh, but that's probably not something we want to do. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for input. Any more comments or questions? If no, we are on the any other business. Anything else you wanted to uh, raise today about core? That's also another no. 
then we can adjourn the meeting a little earlier uh, than the official end time and talk to you latest at the next one in two weeks. That's awesome. good. Thank you all. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.